and uh, it's now um, it was released in September, and now as uh, it goes on in in other ways, and this is one of those ways. So I'm very grateful for that. The themes are widespread, and I think more and more people are realizing that that uh, they have things to talk about in their towns that may not be on the Mullica, but um, there are common themes. Uh, tonight's theme of marine debris, plastics, and illegal dumping are very timely and were a persistent theme in, in the movie as well. So I just want to say on, on behalf of uh, over 40 people who participated in this movie, uh, thank you to the presenters. And um, um, we, I hope that everyone will stay involved and, and, and take these messages to heart and, and take them out into their larger community. So thank you very much. All right, awesome. Thank you, Steve. Um, it's a great film too. Um, if you haven't uh, had a chance to check it out yet, um, I can put the Go Green Galloway website uh, in the chat uh, towards the end and you can um, check it out. Um, but we are going to talk a lot about what was mentioned in the film um, and some of the folks uh, that are presenting tonight were in it as well. Um, and so, yeah, like uh, Steve mentioned, one of the issues that's facing the Malika is debris, and it can be in the form of illegal dumping, single-use plastics, microplastics, it's really everywhere. Um, and uh, our speakers today, we're going to kick things off with uh, Paul Signor from uh, the JC Near. He's our uh, watershed ambassador. Um, so he um, is located in WMA 14. That's one of the many watersheds that we have in New Jersey. Um, we also have Rebecca Turgan um, from Atlantic County Clean Communities. And uh, so she's gonna be speaking after Paul. And then we have Angela Anderson from the Long Beach Township, uh, or she is the Long Beach Township uh, Sustainability Coordinator um, who's worked on a lot of projects as well. So. Um, we're going to have a lot to cover tonight, but it's going to be great. Um, and then afterwards, we will open it up to questions. So again, save questions um, yeah, or questions will be saved towards the end, but feel free to put it in the chat. If something comes uh, to mind, we'll review all the questions at the end um, and then talk a little bit about how you can get involved and maybe some cleanup events this spring. Um, so we'll talk about that and also talk about the next Friends Along the Malika River uh, presentation, um, which will be about invasive species. But, all right, I think, uh, I think we covered uh, everything in the beginning. Um, Paul, I will let you uh, kick us off tonight. So um, go ahead if you wanna share your screen and get started. All right, everyone. So I'm gonna start with a little introduction on marine debris. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my video and then start sharing my screen. So let's see here. Okay. Everyone see my screen all right? Yep, looks great, Paul. Okay, good. So let me go ahead and play. Okay, so let's discuss an introduction about marine debris. So what is marine debris in the first place? So technically, if we wanna go on a definition that uh, Noah has prepared, it has to be a solid material, it's manufactured, and it's either intentionally or accidentally introduced into the water, right? So being marine debris, that implies that it's in the ocean in uh, salt water, right? So next, common types of marine debris that you'll see, obviously everyone pro has probably seen stuff such as plastic water bottles washed up on the shore or plastic bags and containers, glass, metal in the form of cans or fishing hooks or machine parts, paper and uh, derelict fishing gear is a big one around here. So let's go a little bit more in depth about those things. So how does marine debris even enter the water in the first place? So the most obvious one that comes to mind when a lot of people think of uh, trash getting into the ocean is people intentionally littering. And that is a big part of it, but it's not, uh, it's not the sole source of this, right? So we have intentional litter, but also even when 
garbage is properly disposed of, sometimes it can get swept up by the wind from proper trash disposal, uh, such as landfills, and it'll ma eventually make its way into a waterway and out into the ocean. Um, another type of marine debris is when it's actually lost at sea. So, for example, trash coming off of a vessel, such as a large ship, or maybe even an oil platform in the middle of the ocean. So that's how uh, 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 marine debris can get into the ocean at sea actively. Um, and then we also have another type of marine debris, which is called disaster debris. That's when it's washed away by a large storm or another natural disaster, and it happens all at once. So that's when you get a lot of housing material and garbage and um, even abandoned ships sometimes wash out and that can be very large a large influx of marine debris all at once, right? So why should we even care about this, right? So to the right here, I put that classic kind of image of, you know, the poor sea turtles, right? Everybody loves sea turtles. That's just a, a good visual for how uh, different types of marine debris can impact wildlife, right? So obviously our first point, it entangles wildlife. So a lot of stuff like the derelict fishing gear I was talking about comes in the form of ropes and nets, right? And that material can end up wrapping around marine organisms and it can actually strangle them to death or it might hang on and strangle them for so long that they start to grow around it, right? And it starts cutting off blood flow to limbs and other parts. Aside from strangulation and actually entangling wildlife, uh, wildlife can also ingest different types of marine debris. And that's a problem because not only is there potential for suffocation if it gets stuck in their throat, but when they do swallow it, and for example, a plastic bag, um, sea turtles often ingest plastic bags because they look like one of their favorite food sources, which is jellyfish. And when that plastic ends up in their stomach, it ends up just taking up space. And obviously they can't extract any nutrients from it, but they end up thinking they're full because their stomach is full with something, but it's not nutritious. So they may actually starve to death because they won't eat because their stomach is technically full of something. So they don't have the urge to eat. Um, when it does, when wildlife does ingest it, ultimately that means it also ends up in our seafood, right? So fish ingesting plastic um, will ultimately end up maybe on your dinner plate if you end up eating those fish, right? So it makes its way up the food chain. Um, another potential uh, impact of marine debris is that it smothers habitat, right? So for example, um, a delicate marine habitat, such as a seagrass bed, if it's clogged up with plastic, those plants aren't getting any sunlight and that can cause the environment uh, to degrade and lose that type of habitat. Or another famous one, coral reefs uh, being uh, bombarded with trash are going to be less productive than if they were clean. So also we need to consider that a lot of this marine debris is potentially dangerous to people. So um, marine debris washing up on our, our public beaches that are frequented by tourists. So a lot of that can be in the form of uh, shards of glass or rusty metal that can be pretty dangerous to people waiting in the water. Um, abandoned fishing gear, as I was talking about, even when it's abandoned, uh, it still, it doesn't stop catching animals, right? So it doesn't have to be commonly used by a person to keep working. So those traps and those crab traps and lobster traps, they'll keep continuing to catch organisms. And since nobody's coming to check the trap or release anything, they end up either dying of starvation or in the case of animals that can't breathe underwater, um, such as dolphins getting caught in large fishing nets, they drown. And it also impacts our economy in the sense that it's harming uh, uh, commercially fish species, but also in the fact that it's detracting from the beauty of our tourist sites, right? Because nobody wants to come to a beach that is full of disgusting trash everywhere. That's just common, common sense, right? So 
that can really impact areas that rely a lot on tourism, especially along the shore, um, and that will impact the economy uh, ultimately. So we hear a lot when we talk about um, trash in the environment about how long does it take to break down, right? So degradation time. So here are a few common ones uh, to give you an idea of how long they take. Uh, for example, cigarettes, they take about five years to start breaking down into their smaller components. Aluminum cans can take up, uh, up to 100. Uh, monofilament fishing line is a big one around here because uh, fishing is such a popular activity. If it's not properly disposed of, that monofilament line ends up in the water and it can take up to 600 years to start breaking down, right? Glass, potentially never in our lifetimes, um, about a million years uh, estimated. And plastic bottles and styrofoam, which are the big ones here, they are, pretend, they are pretty much unknown. We don't know how long it takes those kind of materials to break down uh, because it happens so slowly that there's not really a way to get a measure of that, right? So it can remain pretty much indefinitely within the environment. But when we talk about degradation, plastic does not ever fully decompose. It's not organic material. It can't be decomposed like that, right? So when plastic does start to break down and degradate, it turns into what's called a microplastic. And that's essentially just what it means. It's a small plastic, right? So it breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. This is a problem because not only is it harder to clean up um, as opposed to simply picking up a bottle, there's many small particles scattered throughout the water column, but microplastics are a lot more easily ingested by organisms. And since they're so small, they can ingest a lot of them. And eventually that builds up as those organisms get older because this uh, microplastic has the potential to build up inside them and not pass through. Um, and as well as biomagnify up the food chain. So a smaller fish that eats a small amount of plastic accidentally is going to eventually make its way into another fish that eats that fish, but they don't just eat one. So they eat many of those small fish that are ingesting plastic. And as a result, they end up with a lot more plastic than we originally started out with. And that magnifies biomagnification up the food chain. And when it gets to us, when we're eating very large species like tuna, uh, we could potentially be ingesting a very large amount of plastic in a single sitting. So that brings us to the last point here is that it's not really known what this kind of effect is on human health. There's not a lot of data out there to show um, the effects of ingesting microplastics in humans. Um, so we, we aren't aware of the potential health impacts and it, it could have um, serious health implications, but the truth is we just don't know right now. So now that's it for my introduction. We're gonna pass it along and talk a little bit more in depth about other marine debris. So thank you for listening and I'm gonna pass it along to the next speaker. Awesome, thank you so much, Paul really uh, great points to make about marine debris. So um, a good way to um, start us off, I'm gonna pass it now to Rebecca, who's going to continue. So thanks, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces or familiar names here. So thank you all for joining. I'm just gonna share my screen. All right. There we go. Um, so I'm here to talk to you guys a little bit about standard litter, um, because as Paul mentioned, everything that you see on the roadways and on the land eventually ends up in our waterways. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Rebecca Terrigan and I am the Clean Communities Coordinator in Atlanta County. So we are kind of the first line of defense for marine debris in this region. So our main program is the Adopt a Road program. We have groups that adopt one mile sections of county roads. Um, we also do community cleanup days. And then the groups that do the adopt road program can get many grants. It's only $200, so it's not a huge money maker for them, but it's a nice little incentive. 
Uh, we host a thank you dinner normally in non-COVID times. Um, this is a link to our newsletter. I'm not gonna take you there because it'll probably won't load properly, but we send that out every month to keep everybody updated on what's going on in the community. These are our statistics for 2021. Um, our volunteers did a great job. Um, so we had 318 volunteer cleanups, 1,000 bags of litter, 675 bags of recycling, 24 tires, and they cleaned up 371 miles of roadway, which is great. Uh, so this is how our program works. We do um, online recording. So they go to our website, acoa.com slash adopt a road. Um, they can take a look at what roads are open, what roads are adopted, and then they can submit an application to adopt one of the open roads. Um, and then once they are starting the cleanups, they just fill out the summary report on our website. This tells us what they collected, where, where they uh, did their cleanup, and if they need someone to come pick up the bags for them. And this all goes directly into my email, so it makes it pretty easy to keep track of everything. Um, and then this is important on my end. Um, the data that people send in on those reports is really important because I have to send in that data to the state. Uh, because for those of you who don't know, the Clean Communities Program in New Jersey is funded by a grant, a statewide grant. So all the towns and counties and parks get a chunk of money to do this program. And so to continue that program, we have to show that we are putting that money to good use. So we really need all that data from our groups to show uh, what they're doing, how much they're cleaning up and that sort of thing. Because we do have a lot of groups that just really love to clean up, they're passionate about it. So they don't, they don't understand why they need to send in data because they're just doing it as they walk their dog and that kind of thing. And this is the reason why, because if we wanna keep the grant going, if we wanna keep the program going, we need to show the proof of what the progress we've been making. So that's just um, an FYI. We also do a lot of community events. Um, this picture was taken pre-COVID, pre um, but we have gotten back to the community events, um, outdoors, everyone kind of spaced out, wearing masks, that kind of thing. Um, so that's nice to get back to that. So the way these usually work is they have to be organized by community leaders, such as you guys who are all on this call today. You can contact me, you can contact your, your township. Um, if you have a spot in mind that's really dirty and you wanna get it cleaned up, um, that's where we come in. Um, I know Steve and the Galway Green team have done a number of these. Um, so they're always uh, much appreciated. What the ACUA can do is we can provide supplies, we can pay for disposal and provide disposal. We can provide publicity, we'll put on our social media, we'll send it in our newsletter, all that kind of stuff to make sure you get volunteers out and kind of what other, what other support you need. Um, we are here for you. So we usually ask you to get you know, permission from the township and sometimes the townships provide all the things that we can provide so you guys don't need us, but, <laughs> um, and that's great too. And the events can range anywhere from 20 people to we have up to 600 at some of the bigger events. So really anytime you wanna clean up a specific area, you know, we can try to make that happen because the goal is to get those dirty areas that aren't covered with the traditional Adopt-A-Road program. I know here in Galway, we have a lot of uh, wooded areas, a lot of trails, and unfortunately they tend to get a lot of litter. They got, we get a lot of dumping. Um, and those are areas that need special attention through these community events. Um, so tr to transition, um, illegal dumping. This is kind of a tricky area because in Atlanta County, the ACUA does not have the jurisdiction to actually pursue illegal dumping violations. That is the County Health Department. So we have people who report dumping to us, but I can't really do anything about it except submit it to the health department. But we can do the cleanups of the dumping areas, which is good. We just have to go through and get permission to be in that area. So if you see any illegal dumping, um, anyone in this call, you can report it directly to the Atlanta County Health Department. That's who will follow up and see if they can identify who did it and um, you know, impose fines or whatever is uh, appropriate. And just, you know, they, we've been increasingly, throughout the state, they've been using cameras in wooded areas to catch some of these chronic dumpers. I'm sure you all know areas in your town where trucks will back up and just dump construction debris or that kind of stuff, mattresses. Um, so those popular dumping areas, uh, we're trying to get more cameras in them to help uh, track this down. So 
the legal dumping cleanups are a lot trickier than just a normal, you know, roadway cleanup. Often with the big equipment you need, um, often with the big debris, I'm sorry, you need special equipment and then you need special staff members to operate that equipment, um, such as front end loaders or dumpsters, that kind of stuff. We always need permission from the township. Um, and we can provide equipment and pay for disposal if you guys get the volunteers out there. Um, it just takes more planning because we have to arrange how to get the, those trucks and stuff out there. Um, I know Steve and I did one at his uh, little fishing spot that he likes. Um, and he does a lot of standard cleanups there, but we really needed a one big cleanup to get some of the big bulky debris out of there. And we had a, we had a great time getting all that stuff out. Um, so this is just some pictures of some of the illegal dumping that we've done. Um, this is obviously some sort of contractor dumped all this stuff in the woods here that was in Pleasantville. Um, this is Egg Harbor City Lake. I mean, look at all those tires. Uh, it's awful. Um, this is the Egg Harbor City Lake. And as you can see, there's the water right behind it. So, you know, if we didn't get that, probably would end up in that water at some point. Um, this is a spot in Atlantic City, right off the marsh. Um, there, we stumbled upon this enormous dumping ground here. Um, and that's one of our special trucks that we use for these types of um, things. It's called a grapple truck. It scoops down and picks things up that we couldn't normally get. Um, so that's a little bit of what we do for that kind of debris. Um, and just in general, volunteer appreciation is really important to us because our program is 100% volunteer based. Uh, we do not pay employees to clean the roadways. We really depend on people like you who care about the environment, who care about the community. So we try to make sure you guys know that we care about you too. Um, so we put up the signs that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, litter pickup provided by this group. We do awards. Um, we post you guys on our social media. Anytime you send me a picture of you in action, I send it right to our social media team. Um, and in non-COVID times, we do an annual thank you dinner. These are just some pictures from the dinner. You can see we have a lot of different types of groups that participate from family groups to this is, um, this is a sorority group, an adult sorority. This is a veterans group. So we have a really diverse group of um, people who participate. And then this is the second topic I wanted to bring up um, related to marine debris is the single use plastic ban in New Jersey. I'm sure most of you know that this is happening but I'm just gonna give you some more of the specifics about what's happening. So the campaign the state is running is called Bag Up End Day. And hopefully you have seen some of our logos already. We have been working on this for the past year, trying to get everyone in the state ready for the bag ban. So these are the basics, um, effective May 4th, 2022. NJ Law will ban single use plastic bags at all retail stores, food service businesses, and grocery stores. Paper bags will also be banned at grocery stores, um, 2,500 square feet or larger. So that's really only gonna affect the big stores, the smaller mom and pop stores can still give you paper bags. Um, this law, and this is kind of being overshadowed by the bag portion, but this is really important too. It's also banning food service businesses from, from providing styrofoam food containers, which as you guys all know, is a huge problem with litter, doesn't break down and it's everywhere. Um, so we're excited about that. And you probably have already noticed that plastic straws um, were banned in November, 2021. They're available by request only now. Um, so, oh, looks like my graphics. Oh, there they are. <laughs> um, so we have two separate campaigns right now. The first that came out was Skip the Straw um, to promote the straw ban that happened in the fall. Um, so this is the graphics we've been using, um, all done by the state program. And this one here is Bag Up NJ, and that's the logo to remind people to bring their own reusable bags when they shop. And just so you know, the graphics are free to download on the website, bagupnj.com. So if your green teams or your city council or whoever wants to print items or bags with that logo, you can go right to that site and download it. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, They've been doing um, social media, web banners, that kind of stuff. Cling artwork that goes in like windows of stores. We've been doing the sandwich force board signs that uh, fold out like that. You can just prop them up throughout an event or in front of a store um, entrance. Flyers, we've been doing billboards, um, business cards. I'm really excited. These actually just came in today. It's a little, um, 
business card size that fits in your wallet. It's got the bag up on one side, the skip the straw on the back, and in the inside is all the information about the bag van, including the fines. Um, because I don't know about you guys, but I've been to a lot of restaurants and they still give me a straw and I don't want to, you know, berate a poor waiter who doesn't know any better, just trying to do his job. So we're getting these cards. So you can just say, hey, FYI, there's this ban in place. Your restaurant could get fined. You know, you might want to pass this on to your manager, uh, you know, a polite way to tell them, let them know that the law has changed. So we ordered a bunch of these. Um, I will be giving them out, but we're also inviting green teams and residents, if you want some to give out at your local restaurants, please get in touch with me because we can give you a supply of them for, for you to use in your communities. Um, and see, um, this is just some of the social media stuff we've been posting. When I say we, I'm referring to the New Jersey Clean Communities Council. This is not specific to Atlanta County, but we have been working closely with the, with the council. Um, these are some of the flyers that we've been handing out, bringing to events, that kind of thing. This is the business card. Um, here's some billboards. We haven't got our billboards up in Atlanta County yet, but we are working on it. <laughs> so hopefully you will see one as you're driving around soon. Um, and just this is some of the outreach that they've been doing um, statewide and in Atlanta County. We've been doing the website updates. Um, we've been doing these like monthly resolutions that I'm sure you do with your green teams already. PSAs, they're doing radio PSAs, there's video PSAs. Um, the uh, DP commissioner has been really helpful. He's been in the PSAs personally and has been really game to film a lot of stuff and do a lot of work with us. So we're really grateful to him. Um, he's been really, really involved in this campaign. So we are very excited about that. Um, media ads, bus stop ads, magazines, billboards, ballparks, you know, there's the Trenton Thunder. Um, they have a big, um, their, their ballpark sign has been changed to show the bag, bag up uh, logo, which is nice. Um, so I think that's all I had. Uh, I didn't want to spend too much time because I know um, Angela still has to talk to you. Uh, so hopefully I hear from you guys soon about your bag up uh, campaigns and I can work with you about all that kind of stuff and your and your litter pickup. So I am going to turn it over to Caitlin. Excellent. Thanks, Rebecca, for the information about the bag up New Jersey. Um, I know there's a huge sign in my local grocery store. So um, that's uh, that's really neat. And actually, if you can, um, so folks can get in touch if you don't mind just putting in your contact info into the chat. Yeah, I had it in one of my slides, but I must have accidentally deleted it. So <laughs> I will yeah. put it in the slide. <laughs> um, I do see there are some questions in the chat, but just so we stay on track, we're going to continue with Angela's presentation and come back to those questions. They're very good questions. Um, so Angela, I will turn it over to you next. OK. Uh, I still see Rebecca's uh, slides show. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, no problem. And thanks for Rebecca for putting your email in, in the chat. That's great. Okay, can you guys see? Yep, uh, looks good so far. All right, and I have to get to a slideshow, right? If I up to the right a little bit more. Yeah, I still I can I see just, your mouse. <laughs> I see I have a header on there. It's all the mute and the start. It all, it's oh, all the there's top. also, um, but by the bottom of your screen to the bottom right, you can click that little presentation icon. Uh, it looks like a little, um, yep. Oh, did that not work? Oh, there we go. All okay. right. You're all okay. set. Okay. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, thanks again to uh, uh, everybody um, on the call for participating with us tonight, uh, to Caitlin and Steve and the whole crew um, for the beautiful film and inviting me to participate to talk about tonight's topic. I'm Angela Anderson uh, from Long Beach Township and I'm uh, right, right across the bay. So I appreciated being um, included in the conversation tonight um, for the proximity of where we are. When we look at our watersheds and how they converge, I'm sitting here in Holgate on the southern end of Long Beach Island in Ocean County. 
And the thing about water and rivers and all the systems is, as we know, it's everything's connected by water. Um, so I, I really appreciate being able to give the perspective on this topic from not just, you know, everybody wanted to be in that green kayak in the film, just kind of kayaking your way down through each piece of the story along the Mullica and the Mullica River watershed. Um, but then you kind of come out to the Great Bay, um, Beach Haven Inlet, and out here into the Atlantic Ocean. So I want to give that perspective of the watershed coming down and um, the ocean coming in and how dynamic changes are uh, uh, changing this topic and some of the other additional topics that they have outlined um, in the future. So thank you, Ben. Uh, so, and of course it's not uh, advancing, Caitlin. Um, I'm trying to see if you have like little arrows. Is there an arrow that pops up in the bottom corner or? Oh, yep, there you go. Is there? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, no so, you know, uh, uh, anybody on the call that knows me, I, my humor is my best communication uh, tool. So um, it's, these are some heady topics that we have here. Um, when you talk about uh, pollution and litter, things that you can see and that you can't see. And I, I, I think the way you really get to that is um, how it's affecting a lot of the species that don't have a voice. So us with this voice, you know, the, you know, we're representing sort of the unspoken um, victims of some of the things that we see happening here. But, um, you know, it definitely uh, is sad. So here we are. I'm in Long Beach Township, Ocean County. You can see here uh, to the south and you can see where our um, watersheds will converge, you know, just south of uh, Tuckerton there. But I'd like to give people that sense of place because uh, maybe some folks on the call aren't exactly familiar with uh, you know, um, the geographic location of how, how we are connected uh, all together here. So on a bigger scale, and I like to kind of give it that 50,000, uh, you know, feet up in the air, when we talk about these, the oceans, right, and marine deb debris, and we, we just see our place, we're our little place in the world, which I think we all agreed was the most beautiful place in the world down here in the Mullica River watershed where we meet the southern tip of the Barnegat Bay watershed. But there's some pretty beautiful places around our beautiful globe here. But you can, there's so many currents and there's all these systems occurring um, globally in all of the various uh, oceans that we have. And I think some folks are con have heard of the terminology gyres and the Pacific garbage patch um, and things like that. So there's an organization called Five Gyres because we have five gyres on the planet and they really are an excellent organization talking about um, marine plastics, microplastics and that. So it's fivegyres.org, um, but it helps you understand when they talk about the great Pacific garbage patch and what that means uh, and where that's um, related to us. Um, but I especially liked when um, one of the fellows was talking about the uh, eels in Lake Fred and they come from the Sargasso Sea. Um, so, you know, these are these when you think about a gyre, just think about it as like a sort of an in water, um, you know, whirlpool. And that's why some of these floatables get stuck into these, uh, you know, um, garbage patches. But if you have the little elvers coming out of the Sargasso Sea, we have lots of other things coming out of there too, which is very you know, important to the topic for tonight. So there's a lot of sailor terminology and I always like to give a little bit of this, but we don't have to get into it tonight. Um, but uh, when I talk fully and heavily about the gyres and things like that, it's really, um, a, it's a really a whole program within itself, but there's a lot of um, old historical uh, you know, terminology that we use when we talk about how, how the waters, uh, you know, uh, you know, are, are laid out. But just kind of put this in the back of your mind, because when we talk about some of the infrastructure, like up in New York City, um, the infrastructure for the, the, the stormwater, the combined sewer overflows were established when we were still saying horse latitudes. So that's just kind of why I put this slide in there, because it's really antiquated um, and uh, it goes, it harkens back to this time. Again, gyres and the plastics, um, you, know, uh, you know, I don't have to go deeply into this, but 
I think it's something very relatable to people because it, the Charlie uh, Moore discovering, um, you know, the great Pacific garbage patch um, and, and why these things were there. We have floatable plastics, sinkable plastics. And then like we heard earlier, um, these plastics that never disappear, but that just sort of uh, degrade. So it's important, you know, to understand some of these bigger concepts when we start to talk about how our how we all converge right up into the Molokai. Um, and this is how they do it. They're, the trawlers come uh, out and they look. They're they're they do into the right into the the garbage patches, if you will, and look for surface. And then they can trace and understand how long this material has been in there. And then you can see a lot of the microfibers. It's important. There's microfibers and microplastics, and I'll talk a little bit about slight differences there in some of the things we're doing about those particular types of things. Because they're sort of somewhere in between this, the seen and the unseen pollutions that we um, have in our waterways. Why am I? Um, so most of the debris that we see picked up in beach cleanups in general, um, don't really come from that community. You know, you don't, it's not like someone's just been walking or boating and, and that's all right there, right? Because we now understand how all these waterways are all connected within the water, um, the watersheds and into the oceans. So it's not like, um, you know, we have to understand that they come from other places. Um, uh, and most of what we're seeing along our coast here in New Jersey is coming from New York City and, and some North Jersey uh, communities. Um, they have what's called combined sewer overflow systems, um, and the currents and the storms drive that debris down towards our beaches. And Rich Dovey talked a little bit about these combined and separate sewer systems in the film. And I think it's real important to show how progressive New Jersey has been in its infrastructure improvements since the 70s and why this is such a, an important piece of it. Um, and you, you're seeing today, like, you know, Hoboken is doing a lot of infrastructure improvements to kind of eliminate their flooding, but also um, some of these kind of combined sewer overflows. So what that means is simply combined sewer, right? So anything you drop on the ground kind of comes together if you have enough flooding and everything combines, right? So the visual can show you that combined, you know, sewer overflows. Okay, and dry weather, wet weather, and it all starts coming and it comes out. Um, and if you really think too much about it, it's pretty gross, but we need to know these things exist and then say, hey, how can we at least stop this one source of pollution coming into the, our shared water spaces? Um, the single sewer overflow like I have over here on LBI, the sewer system is, is uh, a separate system combined and our storm drains directly, you can follow you could drop something and the rain will come and put it right out into our bay. And I would say similar to you guys up in the upper watershed part, all of those tributaries that come into the Mullica and then the Mullica coming down um, you know, into the, the uh, Great Bay. And then we all kind of come together with our stuff and all of this stuff that we have with, with on our inshore side can kind of just match up with some of the stuff that we have coming through the ocean side. And it can create, you know, a, a real mess, especially as we heard earlier in the, when you add a little storm surge into that. And I think that that's one of the more important pieces here when we start to look into climate, sea level rise uh, and sinkage and higher precipitations, we're gonna start to see a lot more of this uh, influx and this combination of stuff's gonna start seeping higher up into the Molokai River watershed. Um, but just so you get an idea of how many combined sewer overflows uh, are in New York City, there's a lot. Um, so I think it's just, just important to reiterate and then where they are when you look at where New York City is, uh, and then it's just a straight shot right along down to, to us. So it's, it's nice to just sort of get that visual, understand what that means and kind of leave it there. Again, still come solution oriented from where we are and where we're, we're living here. Um, Non-point source pollution, as we know, we love the terminology people pollution. Um, as I said earlier, the storm drains um, along the coast meeting the ocean plastics. Um, you know, non-point source pollution residuals are the, 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 the plastics we don't see. Litter is what you do see. And then we have floaters and sinkers. Uh, the nutrients, um, the dog waste, the fertilizers, 
we have addressed that in New Jersey a couple of years ago. Many groups, maybe some that are on the call, helped us get the strongest fertilizer law in the nation restricting um, application and types of fertilizers sold here, uh, training programs for landscapers and things. So identifying the different sources of the pollution, becoming solutions oriented through policy and um, public uh, education, um, considering New, I think New Jersey has to be good at this stuff. You know, it's dirty jurors. We, we've got to be good at this kind of stuff, right? So this, this floatable storm surge related pollution pushes up and onto the land. So this stuff, if we wanted to like contact trace, you know, that, that green cap probably came from somewhere in Brooklyn. I don't know, but we can maybe, did it come from morning light? I don't know, depends. You can see how long it's been in there, how it looks like it's degrading. But as we see the sea levels rising, a lot of this is going to start moving up as we start seeing the salt water line moving up into our fresh water. Um, so that's just something that can come to a later discussion on the future, but still based out of the concepts um, you know, within the film. And uh, just to get a visual and also talk a little bit more about the, uh, we touched on this earlier, but the ghost uh, crab trap recovery program Right, right there in your backyard, Stockton Marine Field Station is doing a tremendous drop, job identifying all of these ghost crab traps with their side scan sonars out of their facility and students and staff and, and real-time researchers, I mean, can, can find these, um, these things and teach people proper ways of handling this recreationally and commercially, try to track back, maybe they got lost in a storm but maybe a recreational person used uh, a life vest instead of a floating buoy to maintain it, forgot about it, you know, whatever it is, there's a high abundance of them and Stockton's doing a tremendous job um, of, of, of recovering them. Um, and uh, Steve Everett, uh, you know, had, had been leading the charge on this uh, to my knowledge most recently. Um, so just to touch on microplastics versus microfibers, uh, we talked a little bit earlier, microplastics, and we talked about how um, different ways of the degradation within the seawater versus if something's on the land, there's photo degradation. Um, again, never disappearing. Every bit of plastic that's been created on our planet is still here in some form, um, but it does go, it does handle differently uh, in, in saltwater, freshwater, land base, and that's something important. Um, this one's really kind of a cool thing. It's a, it's a newer thing in my knowledge base as far as microfibers um, and uh, from, from sewer outflows, an innovative solution. It's kind of one of those things like, why didn't we ever think of that? Um, washing machine lint traps to keep the microfibers out of wastewater. The lint trap on our dryers was created specifically as a safety mechanism for uh, multi-family uh, apartment complexes and, and as a fire uh, deterrent to get those lint traps out of there. But think about that, uh, how much um, comes out of your lint trap. So just think about that. There are companies now working on things to put into your, your washing machine that would help get these microfibers out. Um, and on the microplastic side, just from a, a product production, um, anybody uses a face cleanser, um, you know, there's no like uh, walnut shells in your apricot, you know, walnut um, face scrub. But now they're saying, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't use little micro um, fibers while people are just washing their face and washing them right down into the sink. So those changes are being made by demand of, of people like us saying, just think about it, make the product different because we're going to stop buying it if you don't. Um, so some of the more local solutions that we're doing here, Long Beach Island, Long Beach Township, um, just something simple when we're like, hey, we want to do a cleanup. We want to participate. I was like, I, I can't hand you a plastic bag to go clean up plastic. So we've been using buckets and we've kind of been working with Alliance for a Living Ocean here on Long Beach Island. And now at my new facility here, the Long Beach Township Field Station, where we want to offer buckets as an incentive for folks like, here's a bucket, go out and do cleanups whenever you want. You're down here, go for a walk, grab a bucket, some gloves, bring it back, we'll handle it. And we'll give them, you know, something off on their programming here uh, or, you know, something like that, a reusable bag. And Alliance for a Living Ocean is working with some of the local coffee shops and setting up these kind of little bucket cleanup, self cleanup 
uh, stations, you bring it back and they'll give you a cup of coffee. So we're developing creative ways to integrate the businesses, the local organizations, and people that are just passing through. So it never it doesn't always have to be a big organized cleanup. And we're not handing them that plastic bag to go clean up plastic. Um, our hydration stations uh, are water refilling stations. Um, we started in 2015. Those are my children, and they're you know six and a half feet tall now. Um, but that was our first design, trying to be innovative, trying to say, you know, put water in your bottle, not your bottle in the water. We started just seeing, you know, the need for this. And now we have about 20 of them all along the back road here on Long Beach Island where people are running and walking and really incentivizing uh, getting rid of that single use um, uh, water bottle. Very great thing for a municipality to be able to do. Just put them where your water lines are. And we actually found a local sponsor. And just be careful not calling them hydration station because Brita apparently trademark that or something like that. So I've been trying to get Brita to just donate some to us, but um, municipalities can be very, very simply uh, make some changes uh, to, to help prevent things locally. Recycling is the last thing I was just gonna talk about real quick. Um, we've been working on, uh, you know, municipal and federal solid waste stuff for a very long time. New Jersey started um, trying to find ways of tracking some of the waste, every town had an incinerator. By 1981, we were like, hey, maybe we'll do some voluntary tonnage and just figure out like what kind of stuff that we are putting into that, all these incinerators. 1985-ish, we you know, started being like, maybe we shouldn't call them incinerators. Maybe we can use the, some power out of them. So we've had a long relationship with all of these products that we've have to bring into our life and where are we to put them? So as a re certified recycling professional that, like Rebecca, it becomes our jobs to help all of our taxpayers know what to do with these materials. And New Jersey uh, quickly became a leader in that because of course we're densely popula populated. And by 1987, we had the first source separation and recycling act, first mandatory. And I think what's important here is the scalability of the goals. A lot of people are like back then when they were negotiating this first bill, they're like 25 is too low. You're like, isn't it better than nothing, right? We will incrementally get there. And they did, you know, by 1995, 50% started adding more materials, but that's the negotiation across the aisle. We've got to do it. How are we going to do it? It's an economic and an ecological and a, and a, a human um, conversation here. And um, New Jersey just took a step to take this into the future. Um, oh, where did my, did, did I pass that one? Um, shoot, well, I might've put it in the wrong thing, um, but no, but we can't recycle our way out of the problem, but maybe we could try, right? Everyone's like, you know, we know that recycling is not the answer. Um, and I think people are like, really? No, it, it isn't, but we can find ways of making it better uh, by throwing a value on the material. So the newest thing that New Jersey's done now evolved um, just recently passing the New Jersey recycled content bill. Um, this establishes um, you know, almost like a, a mandatory uh, end, end, end market use for our materials, starting with scalable goals, starting in 2024, 15%, by 2044, 50%. Um, and it closes the loop on our recycling. It's not a way anymore. We're saying we, we're, we're closing that loop. And all of this new terminology, if we all start using it, closing the loop, uh, producer responsibility, it'll take us into the future to get some of this material sort of out of our, our waterway. And one of the newer opportunities that's come up for municipal governments also, just yesterday, DEP announced $9 million for stormwater projects, water quality projects, very much through the lens of, of environmental justice communities. And I think it's really important that any of talk to your municipal leaders on some of these solutions and some of these money opportunities that are out there. There's a lot of money coming um, available because um, we have to, because that's the bottom line. We have to do it. Um, this is where I am. I meant to put this uh, higher up in the slide, slide deck, but I'm over there, the LBT field station. You see me there, the blue uh, out on Long Beach Island. We just opened up this new facility. Um, in uh, June, and I'd love for you guys to follow us, lbtfieldstation.com. 
We are going to be uh, doing all kinds of programming and education and having real-time science uh, happening out of our facility. So please follow us um, on social media as LBT Field Station, and you can uh, join our newsletter as well. And I'm Angela Anderson, and uh, that's my contact information. So thanks. Excellent. Thanks so much, Angela. Um, really good points about, um, you know, earlier we were talking about how different debris kind of uh, behaves depending on where it is in the environment, which I think is definitely important to know and a lot of great projects too. So thank you so much. Uh, awesome. We are going to now answer some questions um, and then talk about what else you guys can get involved in. I know Rebecca talked about reaching out to her about coordinating cleanups, but there are some other things that you guys can do as well. We'll keep an eye out for. Um, so I'm going to scroll up here. Our first question is, um, I think this one's for you, Rebecca. Um, is there a contact person that deals with reporting of illegal dumping um, at the Atlantic County Health Department? Sure. So um, there's not one specific person, but there is the Environmental Health uh, Division of the County Health Department. And within that division, there is a solid waste um, group. So um, you can either contact the Environmental Health Division or um, I don't have the contact information handy for the solid waste uh, portion of that group, but those are the people you're going to want to contact. Okay. Uh, is that something we can find on like a website? Yeah, yeah. Go, if you go to the Atlantic County um, Department of Health, you know, Google that and you should be able to find the contact information there. Okay, great. Um, all right, next question is, uh, have you been getting across the plastic straws harm more than just sea turtles yeah that's a good question it's kind of sea turtles are like the poster child <laughs> for plastic straws um so good point um have you guys used other techniques or um other messaging besides turtles i think that one's for paul if he's still with us hi <laughs> so what was the question again about sea turtles um, I guess, yes, well, this could be for really for anyone if, if um, anyone's used um, kind of the, how, how plastic straws can harm other marine life, uh, not just sea turtles, because it seems like sea turtles are sort of people's go-to critter when they're talking about banning plastic straws. So if anyone has, um, I guess, done something different or talked about how else plastic straws can harm wildlife or the environment other than sea turtles. Well, I think, I think we use the example of sea turtles a lot because number one, they're charismatic, right? Everyone loves them, but also um, they have the more visible uh, ailments that happen when they interact with plastic, right? Every, you know, people have seen the video where it has it up its nostril, the straw. Um, and mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it's not necessarily like the bad thing about plastic straws is not necessarily that they're straws. Like, yes, they can go up a sea turtle's nose, but also it's just more plastic in the water. And that's, really the bad thing which and then it breaks down into microplastics and that's where the trouble starts is that there's no easy way to clean that stuff up so you know we really only you people only really use the sea turtle example because it's the most visual it's also the most shocking thing you can show someone right if it with the sea turtle with the straw up its nose blood coming out it's if they sh shocks them they're going to remember it right and it's going to make an impact on someone so that's why we kind of like people use those uh, images and stuff to get the point across. Yeah. And I think it's, yeah, it's important to acknowledge that, you know, not just sea turtles are being impacted by plastic straws. Um, you know, other wildlife are too. And like you mentioned, Paul, Paul, uh, bleh, Paul plastic straws, um, you know, they break down and they can harm wildlife in the environment in other ways and not just being ingested or going up a sea turtle's nose. And I, I think that uh, a video from maybe a few years ago that was pretty popular, maybe stuck it, like you said, in people's heads and now they kind of associate the two possibly. You know, um, yeah, cause like I, uh, another effect 
that I went into a little bit, I studied in college was its effect on shellfish, right? Um, microplastics being ingested by shellfish like mussels and oysters. Um, and it shows that like they, it can impact their reproductive organs, right? But you can't put that on a poster for someone and like show it, they're not gonna understand it. So that's why you wanna use like cute and cuddly animals because it's hard to sympathize with an oyster, you know? Angela can sympathize with an oyster. <laughs> she loves oysters. <laughs> yeah, we, we can, but like, yeah. um, Tony down the street or whatever, you know, he doesn't. Oh, sure. You know. And yeah. And maybe there's other ways around that, you know, like a lot of, we like to eat oysters and they're filter feeders and they right. can adjust it that way, you know, so there, there are other ways of, of doing that too, but, um, but all good points. Um, I'm going to kind of keep us rolling though, because of uh, time, but um, another question is how do the green teams get access to reusable bags to hand out to their residents? um that's a that's, good question that Go contact your township um or contact me um we have been on a bag buying frenzy um <laughs> so we don't have an unlimited amount but we are trying our best to accommodate requests from green teams we've already given out quite a bit to green teams across Atlanta county um and, but a lot of your towns also have bags too and a lot of times we are buying them for the towns so there are ways, uh, just get in touch with me or your township um, coordinator. Sounds good. Angela, anything different up in your area? Okay. <laughs> no, no, we're, we're, yeah, we're in touch with our county. Um, but I think, you know, each of the municipalities can use their clean communities yes. money. Yes. So um, um, that might be something good for people to communicate with their towns about how they yeah. can use that. Definitely. And I know that, you know, from the county aspect, we have been trying to communicate that a lot to our municipal coordinators. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, a lot of them don't get um, a lot of grant money and they depend on that grant money for their cleanup stuff. So we have been buying them for those towns if they ask. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, if your township coordinator doesn't already know, make sure they know they can use their clean community, yeah. clean communities grant for that. Perfect. Um, looks like there's some interest in getting you, Rebecca, to maybe come to one of the, their green team meetings. So um, <laughs> I see this is from Kathleen. I have been emailing yeah. Kathleen and I am planning to attend the linear right. meeting in March. <laughs> Put everybody's contact info in here too. If you want to ever get in touch, go to green team meetings, um, coordinate cleanups, anything like that. That's all uh, available today, which is great. Um, we did talk in the chat a little bit about microplat or microfibers and microbeads and toothpastes. Um, so um, I mentioned the microbe microbead free waters act that was passed in 2015. Um, so we we're kind of chatting a little bit about that. Um, and I can put I just put in the chat a little bit more about that act that was passed. Um, yeah. So you can read a little bit more into that. Thank you. Yeah, that that's uh, something I'll add to my slide deck because that's an important piece of that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I think our next question then is um, some facilities claim to recycle, but I see them combining trash and recycling when they're picking up from trash cans. Is there a way to encourage facilities to actually care about recycling their materials and not just combining them? Well, that's uh, an internal I'll struggle. I'll have to say, yeah, <laughs> I'd say not everybody has a work ethic like, like you, Caitlin. So, um, you know, you're only as good as the people that work for you. <laughs> so, um, we get those complaints a lot. We definitely know that it's happening. Um, I think it is less and less, I get, like I said earlier, when, you, when there's a value put on that, when people are just like, oh, it's just throwing away and it's not really solving anything. And I saw that, you know, the, you know, the kids in India, like picking through the trash, like these images have to change and it has to start with the municipalities, the counties and the state giving you that value. And I think by the passage of the recycled content law, that's starting to throw this value on this material. Um, we're, we're seeing that, that it's worth something and we're starting to see the markets increase. We kind of flattened out when China, you know, put the uh, green fence and the blue sky initiative. But I look at that as an opportunity for our country to build our infrastructure and, and, and use it as an economic development tool for us. So. I think it's all in the perception of how we present it. We don't want to call it waste, solid waste. It's a, it's a managed, uh, manageable resource. 
Mm -hmm. so the terminology and the value is, is, is critical, but the guy on the back of the truck, he's like I said, he's not you. He's not someone who has this, this ethic and that's a tough nut. Um, but the, the facility that they take that to has to be like, we're not taking it. All you gotta do is turn around one truck and they're like, they're losing money. Yeah. Yeah. And on that note, um, another thing that happens a lot, cause, um, AC way we do collections, um, and a lot of times the recycling can, and you might not be seeing this from where you are is filled with trash. So if the guys are, you know, and that is a huge problem, um, where people are using the recycling cans as trash cans. Yeah. Um, or there's like one plastic bottle on top and the rest is trash bag. So if a trash guy sees a, a recycling can that's filled with trash, he's going to take it as trash because he knows the recycling guys won't take it. So that also is kind of what you might be seeing sometimes. Same thing at specific facilities. Like if you're at a, a restaurant or an outdoor event um, and there's a recycling can, you might see them take it with the trash. But you, if you look at the inside, it's all trash in there. So mm -hmm. that is part of the problem as well. Yeah. Good point. All right, so I think um, we're gonna take some time to talk a little bit more about what you all can get involved in, um, maybe upcoming spring specific projects, uh, events going on. Um, I know Paul has some things um, maybe not planned out quite yet, but Paul, do you wanna talk about um, some of the things that you're, you're thinking about planning? And then I also have some things I know from the JC Near's end. Um, Rebecca talked about, you know, ways of getting involved um, with her efforts. But if Angela and Rebecca, if you want to mention anything else before we sign off tonight, um, please go for it. But um, Paul, do you want to um, do you want to start? Yeah. So as watershed ambassadors um, in my program, we try to get the community involved with some environmental stewardship projects. So. Um, we're always trying to plan more cleanups, public cleanups for people to do and participate in. Um, but a few of the other uh, projects that I have in the works with other uh, partners, for example, um, at Batstow Village, which falls within my watershed management area, we're trying to put together um, some exhibits at the Nature Center for people to learn about aquatic macroinvertebrates um, which are some things that like uh, insects that live in the water that people may not see otherwise to learn about them. Um, we're also putting together um, a guided, uh, a self-guided tour kind of sheet that visitors can take with them to learn about the natural resources of Wharton State Forest and the village itself. Um, and with, I also have projects planned with For uh, Forsyth Wildlife Refuge, Edwin B. For Edwin B. Forsyth. We're going to be uh, putting together some seining programs to teach people how to go out and sane and educate them about some of the species and the fish that we catch, as well as putting together a, a bio blitz around Earth Day um, to catalog some species and learn about uh, different species that live around uh, uh, Molica Great Bay Estuary and educate the public about species that they may uh, encounter while fishing and doing their recreational activities, but things that they may not essentially know, uh, uh, know about scientifically about them. So we're always planning cleanups. We're always trying to get the public involved with uh, stewardship. And yes, I have another ambassador here in the chat with me that Melissa is also an ambassador. So if you have questions, she can also answer them too. Um, but you can always um, contact us. I believe Kay Caitlin um, is my contact information in the chat already. Did um, I can put it in for you right now. Hold on. Uh, okay. I just I just didn't know before. But um, you can you always go. yeah you can always reach out to me um, or any other watershed ambassador if you're interested in getting together a project with a green team or maybe an environmental commission. Uh, we usually work with. Uh, state and county parks are also common partners. And yeah, that's a little bit about what we do to get people involved and out in nature and aware of uh, water quality environmental issues. Perfect. All right. Well, if, if that sounds um, interesting, feel free to contact Paul. Um, I know uh, at the JC Near, 
We also have some uh, events going on um, and a particular volunteer type uh, program around um, debris. Uh, we have a monofilament uh, collection team that goes out and looks, um, that goes to specific monofilament collection sites along Great Bay Boulevard um, and in and around uh, the Jacques Cousteau Reserve. And um, we collect the monofilament, uh, we weigh it, um, and then it's sent to an organization that actually turns the monofilament into rings like that you can wear on your finger. Um, so we just got this started. And if you want to help us um, check those bins, um, you can um, sign up to be a volunteer. So I'll put that information uh, in the chat. There's also a really cool app. It's called Marine Debris Tracker. Um, so if even if you're out like walking your dog and you see a bottle, you can pick it up and actually record it on your phone and then, you know, properly dispose of it. Um, but all that data goes to um, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So um, I'm going to put all that information in the chat for you as well. Um, oh, good point, Steve. Uh, Surf Rider Foundation, too. They do a lot of cleanups as well um, and clean ocean action. Um, so. Uh, I also want to turn it to Angela and Rebecca if they have any final thoughts or things to get involved in um, before we um, let you guys go for tonight. Well, um, you may have noticed your Hamilton friends along the Malka are not on the chat tonight mostly because they have their own meeting about their spring cleanup right now, um, which mm -hmm. is going to be March 5th. Um, as far as I know, that was the plan before tonight. So I'll let you know if that changes. Um, and other than that, you know, we always have a ton of cleanups in the spring, so nothing set right now, but I'm sure there will be plenty for you to get involved in. Perfect. Um, I, I would just love if folks would, uh, you know, um, go onto the LBT field station website and um, join us, um, get involved with our newsletter and see some of the things that we're doing. We're just getting started uh, with some new programming. So um, come check us out. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Angela, Rebecca, and Paul for being our speakers tonight. We didn't give you a proper round of applause for, <laughs> for that. So thank you so much for all of your information and insight into all the amazing things that you're doing in and around the Mullica River, um, Great Bay Watershed. Um, really amazing stuff going on and really great information. So we appreciate your time and thanks everyone for hanging in there, um, you know, 10 minutes over. Um, but it was really fantastic to be able to um, talk with you all, interact with you all and get you um, involved in helping to, um, you know, get, get rid of some of this debris <laughs> we've got going on here. And I know for me too, a huge part of it's also prevention. Um, a lot of my programs um, that I'd like to do also, I really like to emphasize prevention on all of this stuff as well. You know, that's that's another, uh, a whole nother talk though. Um, but, you know, that's the key part of it as well. But um, thank you so much everyone for your support and uh, um, tuning into this talk tonight. Um, I hope you all have a, a great rest of your evening. So uh, stay warm and uh, talk to you soon. Bye everybody.